Hello and welcome back to FPV Reviews. Today we'll be examining the pusher configuration in depth. We'll examine the variations on the pusher design along with their unique problems and their promising aspects as they relate to flight dynamics, aerodynamics, thermodynamics, and structural considerations. The pusher configuration was actually used on what most people consider to be the first aircraft to achieve powered controlled flight the Wright Flyer. It was also commonly used early on in aviation's infancy to provide a clear view from the front of an aircraft for observation of the ground, taking pictures, and of course for mounting a machine gun to take down other aircraft during World War I. The braced pusher design offered a robust, lightweight structure as a major advantage over other aircraft early in the war. In the modern age, this unobstructed view from the front of the aircraft is still very valuable as it gives the observer a good view in flight and the pilot a good view of the runway on landing. Many aircraft have leveraged this even further throughout the years by using transparent materials exclusively in the entire nose section. The lack of an engine or propeller here is also extremely useful for unmanned aircraft as a prime location for sensors such as a gimbaled camera, tracking antennas for satellite communication systems, in terms of visibility, and clear line of sight to orbiting satellites. Even hobbyists appreciate this feature, using it to mount pan-tilt servos for FPV cameras, sometimes even using head trackers to articulate them. Gimbal-stabilized action cameras are also commonly mounted above and below the nose of pushers for purposes of filming. The pusher nose is also a great place to mount sensitive receiver antennas and airborne intercept radar units. The usefulness of the pusher configuration doesn't end there, however, as there are some real benefits to the per potential performance of the aircraft itself, which are not just superficial. For one, the accelerated air behind the propeller is usually allowed in most pusher configurations to have a clear path toward the rear with no other parts of the airframe in its way. Aircraft configured in this way save energy in the form of reduced drag any time the power system is being used. And this feature serves to extend flight time, increasing performance in almost all situations when compared to a single engine tractor configuration. Not surprisingly, it has also been used extensively on autogyros, helicopters, ultralights, delta wing trikes, and powered hang gliders. Also, powered parafoils, powered sailplanes, amphibians, and high-speed experimentals. It's astonishing to consider the wide number of variations on the pusher design as its benefits of reducing drag are applicable to aircraft of so many different types with different speed ranges, propulsion systems, and wing configurations. Although single-engine, propeller-driven pushers are still susceptible to torque effect, P-factor, and gyroscopic precession, which we discussed ex extensively in the single-engine tractor video, many variants are virtually immune to slipstream effect. They usually don't have any offset angle to the motor mounts if their motor is mounted centrally, such as in the single boom variants and twin boom types. With little distance from the propeller to the center of mass and or aerodynamic pressure, it would be of little benefit anyway. Pushers where the engine is mounted behind the tail may have slightly angled motor mounts to compensate for some of the effects that we mentioned earlier, as well as to compensate for the vertical placement of the engine thrust line. While the lack of accelerated air blowing over the control surfaces on the tail of many pushers may be missed by bush pilots and for some aerobatic maneuvers, the consistent control response without it will be a welcome feature to beginners, commercial pilots, and UAV designers who desire precise flight paths, and it will result in smoother responses from almost all autopilots and flight management systems. Pushers do, no, do need special consideration when it comes to cooling, 
as the airflow is not forced through the engine it is as it is in a tractor configuration. In the case of air-cooled engines, it becomes necessary to use ducting in most rear fuselage-mounted installations to achieve proper cooling, whereas liquid-cooled engines can be cooled using a remotely mounted radiator, giving the designer more options in this regard. Whereas internal combustion engines lose approximately half of their fuel's energy and heat, electric motors are much more efficient, and although they still need cooled, the amount of cooling needed is drastically reduced, giving an advantage in cooling system efficiency. But it's not all rosy for the pusher, however. The next problem we'll discuss is one that few pusher aircraft designers can claim to have solved. The prop arc is almost always in turbulent air, usually being mounted behind the fuselage, the wing, or both. This presents a major problem that can't just be ignored by the designer. As the turbulent air from the fuselage is ingested into the prop blades, this turbulence is translated into vibration in the blades, passed on to the engine or electric motor, and then to the rest of the airframe starting with the fuselage. If the wing is also in front of the prop arc, the effect is usually much greater as each prop blade has to go through alternating zones of high and low pressure air. The propeller blade's angle of attack and aerodynamic loading changes drastically at different points in each revolution. And the resulting change in amplitude of the vibration increases relative to the wing's angle of attack. The frequency of the vibration will also vary greatly with changes in airspeed and RPM. Because of these factors, nearly all pusher aircraft have at least one speed and or angle of attack where there is an unusual amount of noise and vibration. In most variants, the source of this vibration is very close to the fuselage mounted sensors, requiring heavy and complex vibration damping mounts for those sensors and can cause problems for the IMUs in the autopilot as well. The chopping effect of the propeller behind the wing can even cause violent vibrations forward of the propeller itself due to boundary layer propagation, causing increased stress on the wing itself, but especially on any control surfaces such as flaps that are mounted to them. These control surfaces and their actuators will need to be more robust and heavier than would otherwise be necessary. Pushers with the engine mounted behind the tail are not immune to these type of issues either, and often experience vibrations in the tail and engine mounts when the tail's control surfaces are deflected. In both cases, the situation can be helped by using a propeller with an odd number of blades and offsetting the engine in the vertical plane in order to separate the propeller shaft center line from the wing trailing edge. Adding flexible motor mounts can help some as well as using a semi-rigid material for the propeller, such as glass reinforced nylon, letting the propeller flex somewhat to absorb vibration. The general location of the propeller on any pusher can also greatly increase the likelihood that any parts of the aircraft which do come loose in flight will get sucked into the prop arc. We may think of this as trivial until we consider the pilot of a damaged aircraft trying to bail out. An ejection seat would be an obvious solution, as would a ballistic parachute for the aircraft itself. However, the pusher propeller location may make it difficult for a ballistic parachute system to be successfully implemented as well in all attitudes. This can also be a disadvantage for unmanned aircraft which are recovered routinely using a parachute. We're not saying they can't use a parachute recovery system, however. It usually complicates the integration of such units immensely, as well as deployment of deliverable payloads using similar methods. Due to the weight of the engine or electric motor and propeller being further aft in a pusher, and especially so in the case of variants when the engine is mounted behind the tail, there is typically less fuselage length between the wing and the tail, decreasing the moment arm for the tail 
to effectively control or stabilize the aircraft in pitch and yaw. Now this can be overcome to some extent by increasing the size of the tail surfaces. However, it will be accompanied by increases in structural weight and aerodynamic drag. Clearance between the propeller and the aircraft structure can be severely limited in some single boom pusher variants. It is less of an issue with a twin boom configuration. Indeed, this is one of its major advantages. However, prop to ground clearance for the twin boom pusher aircraft, and especially for pushers with the engine mounted behind the tail, can be a major issue. It may limit the propeller diameter, therefore limiting the efficiency of the propulsion system for slower aircraft, and can limit the propulsion system size that faster aircraft can have without changing to a multi-bladed propeller, as we discussed earlier. Of course, changing to a propeller with three, four, or more blades carries with it a penalty in terms of efficiency as well. One solution sometimes used for specialized unmanned aircraft with pusher props mounted behind the tail is to fold the propeller blades for takeoff and landing, using a tow rope to propel the aircraft on takeoff, and shutting down the engine to fold the prop for landing, precluding an aborted landing. The propeller clearance problem can easily be solved by making the landing gear longer. And indeed, it's virtually necessary with the engine mounted behind the tail. In this case, it may even be necessary to limit the angle of rotation for takeoff and software, combined with the use of a vertical stabilizer as a skid to prevent prop strikes to the pavement during a less than perfect landing. One common solution for twin boom pushers is to mount the main gear further back to improve the propeller ground clearance geometry. However, it has some adverse effects of its own, transferring more of the aircraft's weight to the nose gear strut, making it heavier, and also upselling the delicate balance of the proper weight distribution needed for the aircraft to rotate smoothly for takeoff. It's also an issue on landing, as with the gear too far back, the nose of the aircraft tends to pitch down harder than usual as soon as the main gears contact the runway. If the height of the gear is increased, it also causes excess drag, a vertical offset to that drag, making the aircraft pitch down when airspeed is increased, and a top-heavy condition for the aircraft during takeoff, landing, and while on the ground. Some aircraft try to circumvent the prop clearance problem altogether by going to a multi-engine pusher configuration using smaller props and more of them to reduce the overall disc loading. While a good idea up to that point, usually the engine nacelles are mounted to the wing with the propellers just past the trailing edge of the wing. If the propellers are of the counter-rotating type, this can solve issues with torque effect and P effect but will not solve the issue of the prop arc cutting through the air pressure differential, creating the same noise and vibration we discussed earlier. These variants cannot use flaps on the trailing edge of the wing in front of the propeller without experiencing excess vibration of the flaps themselves. If the engines are mounted high enough, the props can be clear of the turbulence of the wing, operate in clean air, and be truly efficient. However, few pusher aircraft achieve this. If the engine is mounted too high relative to the center of mass and or aerodynamic pressure, the problem of clean air for the prop can be avoided along with ground clearance issues, or in some cases spray clearance issues for seaplanes, only to end up with the thrust line so high that the plane pitches down suddenly when power is applied. It's also possible to simply mount twin engine pusher engines on pods above the wing center line partway to the tail, giving them clean air to operate in, similar to many common twin engine jet configurations. And this can be a better than average solution to the problem, although most effective when combined with a low wing design and a T-tail configuration. Some rare variants by obscure designers 
Place multiple motors on the rear of the fuselage or the tail with counter-rotating propellers. These can experience some vibrations, however, if the supporting structures are only stabilizers and control surfaces are located elsewhere, such as the rear wing, vibration will be minimal under most airspeeds and angles of attack. This type of configuration lends itself to experimentation in super maneuverability using full flying stabilizers and consequently vectored thrust simultaneously. So in summary, the pusher configuration offers increased efficiency and improved flight dynamics. If the pitfalls of turbulent air ingestion, propeller clearance, and weight distribution can be avoided. Now many designers simply accept these problems in most cases and still manage to produce successful and high-performance aircraft, going on to set records in them in many categories, even claiming a record for flying around the world non-stop and non-refueled. While Voyager was technically an inline twin tractor pusher, the rear engine was the only one meant to provide power throughout the entire flight. A large percentage of pusher aircraft are also canards, as these configurations complement themselves due to their unique weight distribution. Next time, we'll have to examine the variations of multi-engine aircraft designs. Thanks for sticking with us on this rather quirky, in-depth examination of the pusher aircraft configuration. And it probably won't get this weird again until we can cover tandem wings and canards in a future episode. So don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. Also hit the bell icon to get notifications when we upload a new video. As well, please visit our website at the link below to find out more about our advanced projects. So until next time, thanks for watching. Have a good one.